What's up guys, welcome back to the channel. I know it's been a while, it's been about two weeks since we've been back from our uh, road trip. Uh, I know that I promised you guys that I would bring you a summary of our trip and that's the intention of today's video. I'm gonna share that with you guys. I can tell you right off the bat, there's not gonna be any cool pictures or anything like that. It's gonna be straight, just information on our trip. So if you're not into that kind of stuff, you might as well just, you know, skip this video because uh, I promised uh, those people that uh, follow me that I would share some of the information from our trip and that's what I'm here to do today. So I'm gonna, without any further ado, I'm just gonna jump straight into uh, what we got and I'm gonna share it with you guys. So we were on the road for 6,794 miles, 131 nights, okay, total. Uh, what we spent, as far as money is concerned, we spent about, uh, I'll get back to you guys on that for a second. Let's jump to uh, some other stuff. Let's, uh, let's, uh, let's get into the, uh, the truck and the RV and the, and the specifications and stuff like that and, and what occurred on the road and, and, uh, and how it went. Let's talk about the, uh, if you want information about the truck and the RV itself, I'm going to include in here somewhere, I'm going to put the link uh, of the uh, a bonus video that I did a few months back, right at the beginning of season one, that speaks specifically about the rig and the truck. So if you want those specifics, please go to there, go to that video. I'm not going to, I'm not going to waste my time now going through that, but uh, I am going to talk a little bit of the truck. Let's start off with the truck. What did I like? of the truck, the, the likes of the truck during this trip. The truck, which you guys know, I, I own a F450, extremely comfortable, okay? Uh, we spent, uh, like I said, 131 nights, almost 7,000 miles on the road. The truck was extremely comfortable. It, it fit us perfectly. It was myself, Myrna, and two dogs. We had plenty of room inside the truck. It, it, it worked great. Uh, one of the positives about the F450, it, it handled this particular rig. This is a 3791 RD, it's a 40 foot rig. It handled it flawlessly, without a problem. I mean, everywhere we went, up hills, down hills, stopping, going, it, it, it was great. So it, it performed extremely well. So I'm very, very happy with that. The turning radius on the F450 came into play in a couple of different parks. Uh, had we had the 350 or anything smaller, uh, we probably still would have gotten in. I mean, there's plenty of people out there doing what we're doing with uh, smaller trucks or if you're in the Ford line, the 350, I'm sure it would have worked out just fine. But the F450 and the turning radius that it has just made it so much easier and uh, I, I'm very happy with it I'm very satisfied I'm glad I actually went in that direction so I mean I can't say anything bad about that particular issue the dislikes let's get into the dislikes not everything is perfect so there's got to be goods and there's got to be bads so the dislikes the 450 the dually very, very difficult to find adequate parking for everyday driving. Uh, those of you that own dualies out there know exactly what I'm talking about. I mean, that was our everyday driver. Once we parked at the RV, we jumped in our truck and we headed out. You know, when you went to Walmart, Costco, wherever you went, you always had to end up parking way in the back because the truck is big. It just doesn't fit anywhere. I mean, you can, you can be one of those people where you just park it right in front of the store and take up two and a half spots and have the tail of the truck sticking out. We're not like that. We're not those type of folks. We actually parked way, way, way out in the parking lot so as not to bother anybody. So that is one of the, one of the downers of, uh, of the big truck, but you know, it, it kind of, it, you know, it, it kind of weighs itself out. Uh, you, you get one good thing, you gotta have a few bads that go with it. So that that's one of the, the downsides of it. Um, the miles per gallon. So I'm sure there's a lot of questions is how I did. 
I can tell you that before every trip, before we left, I would reset my, uh, my uh, trip. And that would calculate exactly how far we went, you know, how long we were on the road, blah, blah, blah. And more importantly, how many miles per gallon we averaged. I can tell you that depending, I mean, I can get into specific trips, some of them that were a lot of hills and, and you know, mountains that we, that we went through. Uh, but I mean, why bore you with all that stuff? We averaged, I can give you just an average. We averaged between nine to 11 gallons per mile. That's it, nine to 11. Now, I can tell you that once we were in Florida, flatlands, we averaged a little bit more than that, somewhere between 10 and 13. So, you know, I wish we got more miles to the, to the gallon, especially in today's age where diesel is way up there, uh, but no real big complaints, no concerns over that. Uh, I'm very happy with it, or I, I, I'm good with it. Let's just say I, I, I'm okay with it, all right? Another downside, towing capacity. Don't be misled. Don't be fooled by, oh, my God, F450. Uh, it, it should be able to move a house. Well, I can tell you that it moves this rig very easily, but one of the downsides to having the 450 as opposed to a 350 is the towing capacity. Believe it or not, the 350 has a little bit more towing capacity than, than the 450, and that's basically because of the, the gross vehicle weight of the vehicle itself. Uh, the F450 is a little bit heavier, the suspension's a little bit heavier, so, so therefore the towing capacity, if, you, if the gross vehicle weight goes up, the towing capacity goes down. It has to compensate somewhere. So that is one of the downsides uh, of the truck. Enough on the truck. Let's talk about the rig itself. The likes, the likes on the rig. I can tell you right now, and I'm sure if Myrna was here with me, she would agree. All the comforts of home. In this particular rig, we had all the comforts of home. So that's a huge plus. When we were looking to purchase our rig, it was it was a big deal to us. You know, we, we, we were gonna spend three, four months on the road, and not to spoil it, but uh, I am going to be bringing you guys a uh, an update about next season. You know, we did four and a half months this season. Next season, we're just about going to double it. So it's a huge deal for us. Very important to have all the comforts of home, uh, so we can so we can be comfortable. Not to be redundant. Very simple. So this particular rig, the time that we spent researching it and making the decision on this particular rig that that was a that's a plus all the way i, I truly believe we picked we picked a uh, a unit that uh met our expectations this trip this season uh perfectly it was a, it was a great choice i'm very very happy with it and i believe myrna is very happy with it too uh it is big you know it's 40 feet four inches to be exact but yet when you're inside, it still has that cozy feeling to it. It's still pretty cozy, so so it's nice. I mean, that, that's a plus. You want, you want to feel at home, you want to have enough room, but you also want to, want to feel cozy. And, and this this rig, I mean, offered that. It, it, it felt very cozy and we're very comfortable in it. Now, as you can tell right here, these areas right here, those are all storage areas. I can tell you that this particular rig, the 3791, has plenty of storage, okay? Now, even though I am mentioning this in the plus part of the video, or the pluses for the rig, that can easily become a negative, and I'll explain real quick. Uh, it has plenty of storage, but you still got to be very, very careful, okay, in what you carry, okay? You have to be, you have to pay attention to your weight because even though they give you all this space, it doesn't mean you can just stuff it to the gills. You can, but you can easily go over your gross vehicle weight. So that is something that you guys really need to, need to keep a close eye on, okay? Go out there, get weighed, okay? Stop at one of those scales that you see on the highway. It may take a little bit of time off your schedule, but it's very, very important. Nothing can be more dangerous than exceeding your gross vehicle weight while 
while handling one of these things, while towing one of these things. So don't just think that because you have a 450 or a 350 and you have all this storage space that you can tow and anything you want. No, you should still be very careful what you're carrying. Don't get uh, don't get bamboozled into thinking that you could have all the storage so you can take everything you want. No. So even though it's a positive, it could easily go into the negatives. All right. So let's talk about the dislikes. Because we have a unit that I already mentioned is perfect for us. It's very comfortable. It's cozy. But because it is 40 feet, four inches long, one of the downsides to it or one of the negatives is we just don't fit everywhere. OK, you have to be very specific. You have to be very specific on where you go because you just don't fit. Let me give you guys a, a, a little tidbit here in Florida. I would say that 85 percent of the state parks here in Florida, we don't fit. OK. We did find state parks in Alabama. We found state parks in in Kentucky. We found state parks in one in Ohio, I believe. We fit with no problem, okay? But for the most part, and I'm sure that next trip, and I'll give you guys a little hint, next trip, the area that we're gonna go, we're gonna visit a few national parks. I'm gonna let that out of the bag. I guarantee you we're not gonna fit. I've done a little bit of research already, getting ready for next season. We're not gonna fit, we're too big, okay? So that's one of the dislikes or that's one of the downsides of having a rig this big. Another downside, okay? Although you have Flying J, you have Pilot, uh, and we've had fueled up in most of those places, you know, in a pinch, in a pinch where you're running out of fuel if you didn't plan accordingly, which you should, in a pinch, you just can't, you just can't dart into any gas station and uh and number one find diesel or number two fit you just can't do it i'm telling you right now the truck is huge the rv is huge you just can't do it you gotta you gotta plan accordingly uh a rig this size you you have to make plans to where you're gonna fuel up uh, whether you fuel up before you hook up or if there's accessible fuel stations along your route because you're just not gonna whip in everywhere it, it's too big it's not gonna happen so that's that's another one of the downsides of having a rig this big another one tail whip okay for those of you that have never towed anything this big tail whip is a is a is a concern if you don't pay attention to your tail whip you could easily cause an extreme amount of damage okay not just to your rig but you know to others so what do I mean by tail whip? The end of this, this RV to the pivot point of the rear axle. When you turn, you figure your back end is going to whip out from the rear axle from your pivot point and all that whipping out can easily cause damage to cars that are sitting right next to you on a turn lane, a fuel pump stall. I mean, there's plenty of videos on YouTube of people that have had unfortunate incidents of hitting something with their tail whip so that's another one of the dislikes this thing is huge it's great it's comfortable it's cozy it's got all the comforts of home but you need to pay attention to the tail whip if you don't it could, it could be a huge problem so having covered all that let's get into the trip preparation so last season what did we use for trip preparation okay our research our research was basically done online. We Googled all the places that we went to. We, we Googled the do's and don'ts of those specific places. That was a huge part of our prepping for the, for the trip. We did, we did a great deal of research on YouTube, okay? Every time that we decided we were gonna go somewhere, we would YouTube it to find out what was available what was not available, what was good, what was bad. So we did a great deal of YouTube. We used this particular trip. We used RV Parky for our main trip planning. It's an app on your phone. I believe it's free. It's a free app on your phone. And we also use an Atlas map. And we basically pinned everywhere that we wanted to go to. Okay. This year coming up, 
we're going to switch it around a little bit. I'm going to get away from RV Parky, and we've been doing all our trip planning, which, yes, we have already begun. Uh, we are doing it on RV Trip Wizard. Now, RV Trip Wizard, and correct me if I'm wrong out there, YouTube world, I haven't found a phone app for it, but it, it's a web-based uh, trip planner. It does cost money. I believe it's $10.99 a year or somewhere, somewhere around there. Or, or $10 and you just own it outright. Uh, it's a little bit more specific. It's got, a, it's got a couple little more working parts than does RV Parky. But uh, so far, so good. I'm kind of liking it. So that's what we're using for this trip. Okay. Touching on preparation. It is absolutely imperative. It is absolutely imperative. Take it from us. We, we learned during our research that this was important, okay? These things have a bunch of moving parts, okay? You need to get in depth into how everything works on these things, okay? Look at videos, look at your manufacturer's website, like ours is Keystone. Keystone has a section that is specific for owners. They have videos, the how-to videos, the do-it-yourself videos. It is imperative, I cannot, I cannot emphasize this more. It is imperative that you go in there and you learn how everything on these RVs work. It could be the difference between uh, having a good trip, a fun trip, or a catastrophic trip, okay? It is imperative that while you're doing your research, make learning your rig a huge part of that. That's all I'm going to say with that. Planning where to go. All right. How we arrived at planning where to go. What to do. Uh, what to see. It could be expensive and it could be inexpensive. Okay. Remember I told you I was going to tell you about how much it costs the trip. It's all up to you. It could be inexpensive and it could be very expensive. I've always said it and I think you've heard me say it uh, in other videos. There's a difference between living on the road, or in our particular case, extended part-time living, because uh, we're not full-timers, as you can tell, I'm sitting at home. Uh, we do own a Bricks and Sticks. It could be very expensive. If you go out on the road and you, be, and you make it a tourist, and you make it a touristy uh, a trip, you're gonna spend a ton of money, okay? Or you could just go out and live on the road, reality, on the road and it costs you a little bit less if you live here you can live here with no problem in our particular case we did both okay we did a little touristy stuff we went specifically to visit things that we wanted to visit and uh we also did stuff that was free so we sprinkled it upon we sprinkled it uh you know a little bit of everything and it worked for us that, that that's what works for us so you got to be very careful when you're planning what type of camping you want to do. <clears throat> All right. While on the topic of pre-planning, okay, you can either reinvent the wheel or you can, uh, you know, reinvent the wheel, be a trailblazer and go out there and, and do everything brand new or during your research, you can pick and choose places that other RVers have already been to and, and, and you know, pick and choose what you want to do from, from the research that you do. That's what we did, okay? There were some spots that we specifically went to that we wanted to visit and there are some spots that we went to because I saw other RVers do it, specifically YouTubers, and I said, you know what, that would be very cool and that I, I want to do that. And, and we went and we followed them, okay? So that's the approach that, that, that we took. I'm gonna take this moment and I'm gonna, I'm gonna give a shout out to those people that were inspirational, channels that we followed specifically that led us to doing the things that we did uh, because obviously this is our first rig and uh, it was new to us. So if you don't learn from others and you don't learn from others' mistakes, you're bound to make them. So I was, uh, I was really big on doing research some of the channels that, that, that I followed, okay, I followed uh, Mark and Trish 
from Keep Your Daydream. That's an excellent channel. They've been on the road for several years with a family and pets. So I followed them. I did a lot of research. I actually visited a couple of places that that they uh, recommended, that they went to. I, I, would be, I would venture off to say that I even probably traced their exact steps. One of the one of the places that we went to was Traverse City, Michigan. Uh, the only reason we went to Traverse City, Michigan was because of uh, Mark and Trish from KYD. So that's one of the channels that we follow. Uh, Jerry from I Love RV Life. He's predominantly from the Georgia area, the North Georgia area. Uh, there's another guy that we specifically went to uh, Georgetown, Kentucky to visit the, uh, the Ark Encounter because of Jerry. He posted a video. Uh, it was an excellent video because of that video we went there specifically to do that because it was something that i said you know i, I want to try that i also went to helen georgia because of jerry from i love rv life so you know we did a little trailblazing ourselves we went to a, a, a bunch of places ourselves that we wanted to go to but at the same time we also did uh some stuff that others did that was one of them uh, mark guido from grand adventure Mark, Reed, Mark Guido, I gotta say, is probably one of the best narrators. Uh, his videos are phenomenal. Grand Adventures, okay? He does, he's been all over the country, but most of his videos are uh, upper Midwest or, or, or upper West, you know, Utah's, Arizona's, Colorado's. Uh, he has some apps, I cannot say this enough. He has some fantastic videos very informational i mean that guy is a must uh, another hint i'm going to be using and i'm going to be revisiting a lot of his videos for next season hint hint so mark guido is another one phil and stacy from you me and the rv they have a bunch of great information uh, regarding general rv okay great channel great people to follow uh chad and tara I'm sorry, did I say Phil and Stacy are from uh, You, Me, and the RV? And Chad and Tara from Changing Lanes. I had the opportunity to actually meet Chad and Tara a few years back at the Tampa RV Show. Great people, fun channel. They got a lot of great content, and they got a lot of great places to visit. So they were very inspirational as well. Now, I got to mention two other channels. When you own one of these things, if you're not very handy... If you're not handy with tools and you don't and, and you're not the kind of person that can fix a few little things here and there this is gonna be a very expensive hobby okay very very expensive you can't be calling a mobile mechanic every time you have a little glitch you got to be a little hands-on you got it you gotta gotta know what you're doing okay one of the channels that I follow actually two actually I have three channels one of the channels is Brian from uh, RV with RV with Tito. Okay, that guy is a phenomenal, phenomenal do-it-yourselfer. He has a bunch of content on his on his page regarding do-it-yourselfers. Okay, I highly recommend him. I highly recommend Tom and Caitlin from Morton's on the Move. Another guy, I think he's an engineer, believe it or not. Young guy, young dude. They're both a young couple. Great information, not just necessarily about do it yourself although he has a bunch of projects on there uh but also rving in general and then lastly jared from all about rvs i would be a fool if i exited a do it yourself comment or a do it yourself part of my video without mentioning jared from uh all about rvs everything you need to know about rvs i mean the channel name says it all Jared has it. He's got a video for just about anything. Okay, great guy. He's part of the uh, Campendium uh, organization, but great guy, great channel. If you get a chance and you want to see some great content, go back and look up these folks that I just mentioned. These are great channels, and you will not be disappointed. All right, so enough of that. Let's get real quick, and I'm getting toward the end here. Let's get real quick of uh, things that we learned while on the road, okay? What did we learn on the road? Now, granted, folks, these, these things have been talked about by others on YouTube, probably at nauseum. But this is for my people, you know, my followers, those that, that, 
that like what we did on the road, and I'm gonna bring that to you guys because it's reality. What we learned, okay? I think one of the most important things that we learned is there's a certain etiquette that for the most part, everybody at RV parks follow, okay? For the most part. What we learned is that you will occasionally come in contact with some folks that care absolutely nothing about etiquette, have zero etiquette when it comes to campgrounds, okay? You need to be ready for that. You need to prepare yourself for that. Not everybody is going to do the things that you do, okay? How you deal with those things is what's going to determine whether you have a good trip or a bad trip, okay? Just, just understand that not everybody's going to follow proper etiquette. Uh, what do I mean by proper etiquette? Well, respecting someone's campsite. Uh, we did learn on this trip that not everybody does that, okay? I'll give you a perfect example. We were in, in Georgetown, Kentucky, was it? Yeah, we were in Georgetown, Kentucky. There's a video in there, and I actually allude to it on the video. And my fears that I expressed on that video actually occurred. We had a campsite that right behind our rig, okay, were three blow-up play, PlayStation areas. And there was no walkway. There was a walkway a few campsites down, but because they were directly behind RV, everybody walked through our site. I mean, they were polite. They would say hello when I was sitting outside, but nonetheless, I could have been out there having a drink, having a conversation with my wife, uh, playing with my dogs, and I'll get into that in a second about dogs and etiquette. They would just come and walk right through the right through the campsite. They could care less. Uh, I guess they figured it's you know it's there. Might as well might as well just cross through. And they would just come right through and 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 not care that you were there. That was a huge issue. And, and you got to learn that that that's going to happen. And you got to learn to deal with it. Sorry, I had to uh, relocate here real quick because. Uh, I was kind of like in the shade there, and I don't think I don't think it was coming across real well. Uh, so, campground etiquette. Let's talk about pets and campground <laughs> etiquette. I'm not going to get into the whole pick up after your pet and stuff like that. Some people are gonna some people are gonna do that, and others are gonna care less. Hey, sorry about that. <laughs> Let's talk about one little thing about people crossing through your campsite. Now, just because you're sitting outside with your pet and just because your pet you don't consider aggressive, at the end of the day, folks, remember, it's an animal. Okay, you don't know how you don't know how they're going to react. All right? I'll give you a perfect example of uh, one of the campgrounds that we were at. We were sitting in our site I was sitting outside. I was on my phone looking at videos or doing something. I had my dog, Mia, who happens to be sitting back right back here somewhere. I had her on a tether, okay, outside the campsite. I was doing everything right. I was I was with her. She was, she was accompanied. Uh, and this gentleman from the campsite next to us came around his campground to his to his working side of the campsite, which he has all the right in the all the right in the world to do. I mean, he was doing something with his hoses or something. He waved at me, I waved at him. As soon as I waved at him and he waved back, Mia, who was tethered, uh, for some reason started barking at him. I don't know, she's an animal. I don't know, She he was wearing a big straw hat, maybe she didn't like that. I'm not sure what it was. Well, this gentleman, decided to turn around and just walk right into my campsite. Uh, I'm not gonna say anything bad about the gentleman. He was just probably trying to be, you know, friendly. And as soon as he started walking into the campsite, Mia, who happened to be a few feet away from me, got up and started barking at him. Well, this gentleman, I guess, didn't pick up on the fact that she was, she didn't like him for some reason. And he just walked in and walked in and walked in until Mia actually lunged at him. Luckily, she was tethered, okay? Luckily, she was tethered and didn't get to him. She's a, at the end of the day, she's an animal. 
she's an animal. She's not aggressive, but for some reason, that particular day, she didn't take too kindly uh, to this gentleman walking in. Once again, proper etiquette. Don't come into somebody's campsite unless you've been invited, unless somebody engages you in conversation. This gentleman just waved and walked right in. I mean, it could have been a big, big problem. So just be aware that while there is no ill intent, I don't believe there was in that particular gentleman's case, uh, he could he made a mistake or he could have he, he could have made a mistake that that could have been a problem for him and me so you know mind your p's and q's when you're walking up like up on people's campsite okay there's proper etiquette don't walk through people's campsites uh, especially if they have pets you don't know how they're gonna react let's not beat a dead horse uh, no pun intended let's move on noise okay every single campground that we've been at has had a uh, quiet time whether it be 10 to 8 in the morning 10 to 7 you know 12 I, we were at one that was midnight to 8 okay not everybody abides by that not everybody abides by that and not every park is going to enforce it for crying out loud most of the parks don't even have people on site to enforce it so proper etiquette folks Mind the uh, noise restrictions, okay? One of the, another thing while we're on the what we learned on the road topic, entertainment, okay? As most of you know, or as all of you know, this was our first season on the road. So everything was trial and error. Everything was new to us, okay? So what we did for entertainment while we were in the RV was all new if we landed in a campground that didn't have a cell phone connection we were basically out of luck because what we chose to do on the road was basically stream through our uh, hulu netflix that type of stuff but you know as well as i do if you don't have if you don't have data if you don't have connection on your phone none of that's going to work okay uh, a lot of parks didn't have cable or didn't offer cable so just be prepared to deal with those kind of things. You're not always going to have TV. And I mean, you can only read so much and you can only play so many games on, on your phone. So that was one thing that we learned. We're going to upgrade that system. I don't know exactly how, but I'll share that with you guys. We're definitely going to have it for next season. But that's, an, that's a key issue. Know what you, you know, plan ahead. Know what you want. Know what you want to do while you're on the road. And make sure that you have all your stuff planned out. Because... You're not always going to find cable at a park, and you're not always going to have data. You're not you're not always going to have Wi-Fi. Uh, plan ahead. Mail, okay. Mail while on the road. Now, remember I mentioned there's two types. There's full timers, and then there's people. Well, actually, there's three types. There's full timers. There's your weekend warriors, and then there's people like me, the in betweeners the extended full timers okay we're not a weekend warriors by no means we're gone four and a half months and again i'm not gonna next season probably a little bit more uh but we're not full timers either so full timers from what i understand the research that i've done full timers basically uh have mail forwarding systems okay that takes their mail and they go through it and you can select what mail gets scanned or photographed so you can see it. When you're a extended part-timer like myself, I, you know, and, and I live down here in South Florida, there's not, there's not that many of those places here. So I chose to have a family member who lives down here. I chose to have my mail forwarded to him. Uh, that was that was the best I could do uh, for next season I'm going to I'm going to look a little bit more in depth on how to handle that because that didn't work out great don't get me wrong my family member my cousin actually did a great job and I really really appreciate it. I'm indebted to him for doing it however you know it was a it was a pain in the butt for him and at, as well as me you know the post office even though I put a mail uh, forwarding address 
for a certain amount of time. You know, some mail went to his house, some came here to my house. It was a disaster. It really didn't work out the way that I envisioned it. So mail is a big issue. Lastly, on one of the things that we learned as far as mail is concerned, packages on the road, okay? So with the exception of maybe two places that we were at or three, everywhere we went this past season was three to four days, okay? We stayed three to four days. There was an incident that I had with my automatic transfer switch uh, that I needed to, to, to fix it while I was on the road. And I had a pack, I had one here at home that the, that Keystone had sent me because I guess they knew that they had an issue. There was a lot of problems with uh, the 20s and 21s uh, automatic transfer systems. Or, so I already had one on hand, but I, I had to get, I left it here at home. I didn't, I had a new one on, on, I had just installed. I didn't think I was gonna need it, but I left it here at home. Well, I had to get that package forwarded to me, okay? I chose to, to have FedEx do it because I remember years back when it positively has to be there overnight. Well, that, that didn't quite, that didn't work out that way, okay? Let's just say it was a complete disaster. Eventually, the whole problem had to get settled with UPS, okay? We chose to have it reshipped. It got lost. It was a disaster, okay? Just be aware of that. If you're gonna order something to be delivered, make sure you're gonna be there more than a week to, to, to fix those issues, even though you overnight it. In our particular case, the package was overnighted, didn't make it, didn't make it the next day. The following day was a weekend or a Sunday. It didn't make it on Sunday because they didn't deliver on, month, on Sundays. And Monday, we had to be on the road by a certain time. So we missed the package. Uh, it was, it was a complete disaster. So that was one of the things, that was another thing that we learned while we were on the road. Uh, another thing that we learned, basically reality, okay? If you're a full-timer, this part doesn't really come into play. But you're if you're a part-timer like we are, okay, we had this issue. We have a house. We have a house with running water, electric, if you're going to be gone four or five months or more, you have to have somebody to watch your place, okay? You have to have a house sitter, in my particular case. Again, it was my cousin, the same one that was doing the mail for me, okay? You know, he was coming in every two weeks or so and running the water and, and, and issues like that. So you got to have somebody run, you know, watch your house. And why do I say that? Because things break. Even though you're not using them, things break. And I'll give you an example. While we were gone, my camera system, my security camera system broke. My pool pump sprung a leak. The shower heads in my master bedroom, I guess because the water that we have down here in Florida, is kind of hard and we don't have a water softener system, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I guess because of lack of running, it created the uh, the the hard water and the, the the shower head stopped working. So whenever my cousin came and ran all the water and flushed all the toilets, every time he turned on the shower head in the master bedroom, it would kind of leak over the top. So it was it was it was a, a it was it was things that I had to deal with when I got home when I got back. So what does that mean? What that means is if you're going to be gone for an extended period of time, get yourself a handyman, get somebody that, that whoever is sitting on your house can reach out to them and say, Hey, I need you to come fix this and handle it. Because if not, my water pump in the pool just leaked. Uh, uh, you know, if you don't get somebody to fix it while you're on the road, it could be a, an expensive issue. So we learned that. Okay, we're done with what we learned. Post-trip chores. Post-trip chores. When you get back, even though you clean your rig and your truck while you're on the road, I'm sure, I hope you did. We were on the road four months, so we did a little bit of that. Uh, while we were on the road, okay, I didn't 
I didn't do the roof. I mean, I, I just, we were on the road four months. It, was, it wasn't feasible to get up there on the roof and, and clean the roof. So the first thing that I did when I got home was go ahead and, and clean the roof. I'm gonna add, I'm gonna add a clip here of that and then I'm gonna show you why it's important that, uh, that you clean your roof and while you're up there cleaning, you inspect it. So check this out. We've been, we were on the road for four months and the roof I didn't touch for four months. So I'm gonna flip this around and I'm gonna show you what uh, four months on the road does to a coach. All right. So this is, this is what we got going up on the roof. You can see it really ain't too bad. I mean, I've, uh, I've seen worse on videos. So that's not too bad. And before I actually even start cleaning, I don't, I don't notice anything that's uh, really alarming. Nothing necessarily in disrepair. So, uh, so far so good. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna, I'm gonna hit it. I'll show you guys, I'll put a clip here of the uh, product that I'm gonna be using. It's made by Dicor. It's a uh, RV roof cleaning project. According to the instructions, spray it straight on the roof and brush it off. So I'll give you guys, this is the before, and I'll give you guys an after, and let's see what we got. Here we go. That's not bad. That's not bad. We went from this to that. So it's going pretty good. Tomorrow we will do the rest of this up to there. So here you, here you go. Here's the front of the RV, which I did yesterday. And here's the back of the RV, which I just finished today. It looks really, really good. I'm very happy with the way it came out. All right. Amongst the many things that you got to do once you get back home uh, during your cleaning and stuff like that, which I just did. Uh, I mean, I just showed you the uh, cleaning of the roof. During the inspection, I discovered this. It doesn't look like much. Let me see if I can zoom in as best I can. Doesn't look like much, but that will become a huge problem if you don't take care of it. This little hole right here can easily have been caused by a, a branch falling at a, uh, at a park when we weren't even there. I would have never even known had I not gotten up here and cleaned. Uh, so there you have it. Time to fix it. A little turn -a bond tape and away we go. So there you have it. Uh, what turned out, what, what was expected to be one project, which was cleaning the roof, actually turned into two. Uh, but think about it. Had I not gotten up there and had I not cleaned the roof, uh, I wouldn't have found that tear in the roof. And had I not found that tear in the roof, that probably would have just kept escalating and gotten into a situation where it would have been very, very costly or created so much damage uh, that it would have been very, very costly, like I just mentioned. So it is imperative that you, that, you know, at least three times a year, every four months, get up there and clean your roof and inspect it, check it. You know, like I mentioned, I don't remember when that happened, when that incident, when, when that damage happened, but it happened. And had I not seen it, it would have probably gotten a lot worse. So uh, those, are a, those are a few things. Um, I'm not sure if you quite noticed when I was up there talking on the roof just in front of the rig on the outside of the gate where I parked my rig I'm not sure if you noticed I, I kind of point pinpointed it out but I'm not sure if you guys noticed the the, the gouges in the grass and uh, and and the issues in, in that piece of grass well turns out that when we got back the day we got back the day before it had been raining all day so 
when we went to back in our rig, it was always an issue. I always had an issue there, but you know, we would, we would pull the rig out and then we'd put it back in a few weeks later. So I never really had an issue. We, we didn't move it out every weekend. Uh, so it really was never a problem. But this particular, well, this particular time when we got back from our four and a half month, it had rained the whole next day. So I literally had, I literally had divots in my grass, which were, I don't know, a foot deep. It, it just tore my whole grass apart. So as a result of that, here's another project. Okay, here's, here's another project that I had to do. Check this out. And finally, here's the finished product. This should, uh, this should fix the issue that I had backing in the coach and ruining the grass. By the way, uh, for those of you that are wondering, this is called a, uh, I, want, I want to say it's called gridlock system. Basically it has 13 inches of lime rock underneath. We took out about 13 inches of muck. Lime rock underneath compacted now this is uh the gridlock system you put in i put in dirt on top of it and pour in some uh, grass seeds and away we go and it should eliminate the uh that issue and still keep it aesthetically uh looking good so that's what we got that was a that was a pretty serious project i mean that 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 was a lot of work it uh, it involved a, a a lot of hard work a lot of moving parts it wasn't necessarily RV related, so it wasn't it wasn't trip related, but it was definitely influenced by the RV. Trust me, the RV and the truck. Nonetheless, I had to take care of that because otherwise my front yard would just look like trash every time that I pulled in and out of the RV. So uh, that was another reality. That was another reality check, and uh, and I had to get it fixed. So that's it. That's all I got for you guys in our summary video. Uh, I hope you guys uh, enjoyed enjoyed the information I had to give you. Oh, wait a minute. Oh yeah, I'm forgetting about the cost. I haven't shared that with you guys yet. All right, so the cost. So the cost of the trip. Okay. Remember, 6,794 miles. 131 nights on the road. How much did it actually cost me? I gotta be honest, I do have a number. I know exactly how much it cost me. But it would be unfair and unrealistic for me to give you guys that number because what we did in our trip may not be the way you do your trip or may not be the way these other RVers do their trip. But I'm gonna give you guys, just to be fair, I'm gonna give you guys a parameter, okay? Between $6,000 and $11,000, somewhere in the middle, that's how much almost five months, that's how much we spent in almost five months on the road, okay? Now remember, uh, fuel prices went up, so we were, I mean, in some places, I wanna say it was Pittsburgh or Ohio, we paid nearly four and a half dollars a gallon for, for diesel, so, there you have it. I gave you guys a, a I gave you guys a, a general area, okay? I gave you guys a parameter because in reality, what what we spent or how we did it is going to differ from the way you do it or the way the next person does it. So that's what I got for you guys. I will be putting together a few more videos, but before I do that, I'll give you guys a few hints. Next season starts mid March of 2022 probably gonna be in the area of about seven months on the road and let's just say that we will probably be west of the Mississippi there's your hints until next time